kid. Seriously. <laughs> Welcome to the ambivalent return of the Star Wars in Review podcast. We are the only podcast that's both alive and in perfect hibernation. Over there, it's Luke Neitzel, who once got locked out of his room in college because the guy on this side of the table, Maya Madrid, himself was also in perfect hibernation. Every so often we get together to discuss the news in the realm of Star Wars. Maybe we'll answer some of the questions that we got. And sometimes, most of the time, almost all the time, we review an episode of the Clone Wars series. Give us a like. Give us a subscribe. Whatever you do, don't eat the crusts on your sandwiches. It makes your hair curly. As our listeners know, today's show is going to be a lot different as we dive knee, chest, throat, and eyeball deep into Solo, a Star Wars movie, and our review of it. We're going to answer the emails questions that we also got. And a caution to everyone, this is a spoiler episode where we talk openly about what happened in and our reactions to the latest Star Wars movie. We will also not be discussing uh, box office numbers or the future effect the movie might have on the Star Wars universe. Both of those topics uh, we'll discuss in future episodes. Luke Neitzel, how are you? I'm good. We will do some non-spoiler at the beginning, right. and then we'll warn people that want to turn off that spoiler is coming. But oh. I'm good. I had just about an hour ago, I was at my daughter's first ever baseball game. So that was fun. She, oh. got, she got a hit, and she got to run the bases. And when she got to third, and they sent her home, instead of touching home plate, she just ran straight to the bench. So they had to like make her run, run awesome. back out so she could touch home plate, which is why kindergarten baseball is the best because things perfect. like that happen constantly. So it's it's a good night. That's awesome. I wanted to ask you before we get started with the solo review: Would you like to answer the mailbag question first, or would you like to get into the Star Wars review first? I'm going to leave that up to we, you. We usually do the mailbag first, so why? All why right, mix it up. It is the return of Pat and KC, one of our biggest fans, and he writes, "Hey guys." I saw Solo. Thought it was pretty awesome. Them robbing the train was straight freaking dope. Is there another character you think should get a spinoff next? And then he goes on to write, Also, I got my guy Mike to listen to the show. He mentioned something, and I don't know if it's bad to ask, but he was wondering if Luke is gay and trying to hide it. We don't care, just wondering. Hope this doesn't get me banned or anything. Luke, your response. You can take either one first. It's up to you. <laughs> With the Star Wars character either? Um... Oh, well, Bosk, maybe? I don't know. Uh, I I am not gay, and I have no problem with that question. I refer to my wife as a partner, but she is female. I do it for a couple reasons. One, because uh, it kind of annoys her, and I think that's funny. And two, because, you know, I think that's a more accurate term for a marriage. It's a partnership, so I kind of like that term personally myself. But she... She is my wife, and that question would never get you banned because that's a question I don't care at all about from being offended or having that matter. To me, that is a very similar question to if you wrote in and said, I think Luke might have brown eyes. I don't. I have blue eyes, but I don't really care. And they're majestic, by the way. They are. They're sparkly tonight. <laughs> So, no, I, I don't have a problem with that question at all. And if I was, um, you know, I'm lucky enough to have grown up in a household where being straight or gay or any of those other things didn't matter. It wasn't my parents just taught us to people's who people are as an individual is all that matters. You know, their sexual orientation, their race, all those other things don't matter. So we never grew up thinking that those things mattered or that it was, you know, weird or different to be gay or unusual. And it was maybe in late middle school where I heard people use, you know, derogatory gay slang and, and started putting together that other people didn't think like that and that they were using something I just thought was normal as an insult. The same way as I, the analogy I used before, you know, if you, the same way if someone walked in and started making fun of people with brown eyes, how that just doesn't make sense because who cares? That's where I grew up. That's how I grew up. That's how I'm raising my kids. That's just how I think it works. So I have no problem with that question. I've gotten that question before in my life. Uh, I mentioned on the show I worked at a, a gay bar, and maybe it's the fact that I'm comfortable talking about these things or don't think much of these things that gives that impression to some people, but either way, I don't particularly care because... If I, if I was, I, I would be proud of it, and I would own it, and I would live it, and I would be happy about it. 
So no problems, buddy. You are completely fine to to ask that question, and I think you did it in a respectful way and in a way that shows a, a lot of maturity that probably some people older than me don't necessarily have. I just want to say for the record that Luke is not gay, but he is absolutely fantastic looking. So if that's how you're picturing it, he it's is true. dynamite a number 10. And I have my shirt off right now, so that helps as well. Well, no, it's getting a little weird, but I like it. Let's uh, move on. Oh, sorry, the, well, no, I was going to say the other question then. Oh, yeah. The, the would, one the first one. Yeah, let's yeah it, wouldn't, it wouldn't really be Bosk. So if it was me, I want something a little more removed. Like, I don't want a, a Leia spinoff or a main character spinoff. Sure. And I'd like to go to a different time period so i would probably key in on a, a lesser known jedi from the prequels so maybe have a, a kit fistos who jumped into my mind who's a kind of an octopusy green octopusy type guy that's in all the the movies um or kiddy mundi you know take one of those guys and have kind of a side adventure with them that's not related to any of the other main characters just have it be its own thing and explore some new space yeah, I think that's a good answer. For me, it's just Poe Dameron after this trilogy is over. If you, assuming that he lives, and we don't know if that's going to happen. I'd like a Poe Dameron thing, because I, I, I'm stuck on this idea of Top Gun in space. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that that would be a good option. Well, that's the that's kind of the... It's not bef- after this trilogy, but that's what we're getting in the new animated show, right? right. It's kind of a more... it's And it's Poe, right? That they're doing in... Or is he just guest starring? He's just guest starring. Okay, it's not focusing on right. him. Yeah, it would be cooler if it was just about him. Yeah, I mean, I love the character, so... Let's move on to our solo Star Wars review. Luke, I wanted to start this off as we, we did when we did the last Jedi review that, um, thankfully, episode zero, that never came to uh, to fruition. We started with what we liked. We started with what we thought we should improve on or that they should improve on. And then we got to the nitty gritty. So I want to start this off with you. What are some things that you liked about this movie? So, and this is non-spoilery. This is a non-spoiler so, To start part. with, yep. I think that this movie is fun. I think you will have a good time. I think there is some good action sequences. I think there are at least one surprise that I did not see coming that I absolutely love and enjoy I and I'm excited you. about. So, and, the, and the performances, I would say, are the, the best things about it. And not just Donald Glover. Right. I really like uh, Aaron Iron Reich. In this performance, I think he did way above what my expectations were of him going in there. And it made me think that a lot of the criticism was kind of just BS or people people unwilling to see another person in that role. Because I think he did a fabulous job with what he was given. I, I liked Amelia Clark and I, I like Game of Thrones, but I've seen a couple of other movies with her in it and have not been impressed. So it was nice to see her do something different and, and do well. Glover, of course, is amazing and steals every scene he's in, which we aren't shocked about. Woody Harrelson is reliably Woody Harrelson, uh, which is great. The The person I would want to single out is, and I don't, I apologize, I don't know his name and I couldn't pronounce it if I tried because he's Finnish, but the, the man who's playing Chewbacca now, yeah. I thought really did well. I think Chewbacca came off perfectly in this movie, probably as good as we've ever seen Chewbacca come off. And that can't be easy when you don't have real verbal <laughs> lines to give. But you you really, I mean, you have a history with Chewbacca, so you know who he is, but I felt like you knew more about Chewbacca as a character from this movie. And uh, I think a lot of that is a credit to the actor that played him. Yeah, I think you're right. It's definitely on that account. I have um, uh, four major things that I liked. Uh, I thought... We're going to get to the things that we don't like, and, and I think a lot of it is going to be plot and storytelling, but one of the storytelling aspects that I really enjoyed is that you have four characters that, um, and not all the four characters that you'd assume, but you have four characters that have a distinct arc that are all based around the same theme. And I think to do that, that is the real storytelling achievement of this movie, to pull that off, and I'll get more into that as we discuss it. Um, and we'll get more things that I didn't like as we discuss that next. But I think the themes and how they did that was actually the highlight for me of the movie. Um, like you had said, characters and cast, Han and Chewie had to be right for me to like this movie. And I think that's what I will take away from the movie. Is that they were just perfectly done, in my opinion. We knew that Donald Glover was going to be great. I don't think anybody could have predicted this great. And here's what I mean. He was so well cast. He was so well played. He had a vulner- vulnerability that I didn't expect, but for the effort that he had to put in, if you close your eyes, people have talked about this, and you just listen to the words, he sounds exactly like Billy D. Williams. It wasn't just his performance. It was so far above and beyond 
the respect that he has for this character and the effort that he put in, it was absolutely masterful. I I liked Kira more than I thought I would. I liked L3 more than anybody else on this planet. And um, I liked a lot of the side characters too, especially Enfys Nest. Uh, the third thing I really liked about it, I liked the look of this movie. Maybe uh, more than most Star Wars movies a lot. And then I liked the, la the lack of the Force. There wasn't a lot of Force stuff in this. And I thought it was a good change. And that we needed to see the underworld of the Star Wars universe. And I think we got it in this movie. Now we're going to switch gears, Luke, and talk about the stuff that we didn't like so much. So if you want to go ahead and tackle that, what would you have improved on? I don't think this is a very deep story. No. I, the, I don't think you learn a ton about any of the characters. You don't learn more about them. Instead, you learn more kind of surface things that play on nostalgia rather than expanding who they are as characters. And I also think it's really, really predictable. Most of the twists and turns you know are coming miles miles away so i just don't think there's a lot of depth to this movie it's it's certainly not a bad time but if you're going in thinking you're gonna learn more about people's motivations and what drives them and and who they were i don't think this delivered on any level it's kind of more these are the the beats we need to hit to get us from this point to this point to this point so we're gonna take the quickest route possible much like a kessel run in order to accomplish that. And for me, I would rather see more work on the individual characters. Okay. For me, I think you're right. The plot didn't take any risks. It was very cut and dry. So you have these four themes that I talk about that are all intricately woven and based on the same theme. These four characters working with the same theme, but the plot, like you said, is very bland. And I'm more about theme than plot, but I think they missed a golden opportunity to tell a really intricate and interesting story, especially when you have something like a heist movie that this is and full of double-crossing and backstabbing. So there were some cheesy moments. The Star Wars universe has been known, aside from Empire Strikes Back, when you look at the first six filmed movies, aside from the Empire Strikes Back, and maybe I'm missing part, there are some cringy moments in all of those movies. I don't think there are cringy moments in Force Awakens. You're welcome to disagree with me on that. I don't think there are cringy moments in Rogue One. But in the last two moments, I felt myself cringing. And we'll get into some of the reasons why. But it seems like we're returning to some of that cringiness that I never loved and never appreciated. And I don't want to get back to that. I didn't like the new songs in the soundtrack. I like the old Star Wars music. But it felt like they were trying to marry two soundtracks that just didn't work together. Didn't sound like Star Wars to me. And eventually I came around last time on Rogue One with the music, and I respect that more aside from like the first bit of the movie. Uh, time will tell if I can accept this music as Star Wars music. And those are the things that I, that I really didn't like about this film. Are you ready to go with scene one? All right. Guys, this is a spoiler review. So at this point, if you have not seen Solo, if you are my wife, who is probably going in the next couple days with me, uh, please turn this off and don't listen. Go out and see Solo. Um, and then you can go ahead and hear what we have to say. Have it loaded on your phone in your car. Yes. So that you can immediately hit play on our glorious review while you're driving back on your YouTube app. If it's the last thing you do in your life, perhaps, you know, if that drive is the last drive of your life, God forbid something were to happen, we want you to be hearing our voices as the last thing you hear. Not really. I just want one more view. Just click. Analytically. Just click. It really matters. Hey. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, the blue writing keeps going and going and going. We start off the movie, they extend that. They don't give us the, the scroll, like they, or the, the crawl, like they do, um, like they refuse to do in Rogue One, and they don't give it to us here because this is apparently like a, a Star Wars story and not an episode. And then they give you more blue writing. I can't remember exactly what it said, but I know it pissed me off. What did you think about that? So I, I don't have a problem with them doing it as blue writing. I would prefer that over the crawl because I kind of like how the crawl is just reserved for the main saga stories. But I think that everything in that crawl was pointless. You got that all from just watching what happens in the opening scenes. So it felt like they put narration in for narration's sake. And I'm much more of a, if you can just show me what's going on, then just show me what's going on. Don't tell me and then show it to me. I think you make a good point. If you look back at the Star Wars movies, they didn't tell us jack crap. They gave us that opening crawl but it didn't give us everything and we had to piece together who han solo and job of the hut and they're talking about 12 parsecs and if you stop and think about it for a minute it's gone the do moment you, is gone do you know the origin of the opening crawl it's from flash gordon well or, yes okay. but it didn't originally have an opening crawl and there was that group of young directors spielberg lucas brian de palma 
and Francis Ford Coppola, who are all friends, right. and Lucas was showing them a rough cut, and Brian De Palma said, I don't know what the hell's going on. You need to put something before really? to explain to me what's going on. So Lucas actually didn't envision that crawl at the beginning. It was someone else saying, this doesn't make any sense. And here, I don't think you need that. You would gather everything they told you because nothing that they tell you has really much to do with the story or the plot. There's there's maybe one key thing that matters outside of the opening 10 minutes of the movie and you would be able to figure that out, which yeah. is the the Calaxium. They tell you what Calaxium is in the opening crawl and that you know, that that matters later in the movie but you still would figure out that it's worth value and then the rest is just telling you that Corellia is a Oliver Twist like environment sure i take the different opinion i think they should all have the crawls um since this integral word they've really gotten away from that in these ones but i'm just not a fan of of them just i mean this is the star wars brand own it it's a star wars movie star wars movies have the opening crawl you screwed up with rogue one make it right now that's my feeling on the thing i, I mean i think reasonable people can disagree on it, it is what it is uh, but I didn't like Well, it. I don't think it'll make or break any movie. No, either. and, it, and so it, it's this a actually preference. didn't for me, because we get into the underworld of Corellia, and Han is about to rip off Lady Proxima, who is the boss that he has, so that he can take his lady, Kira, get a ship, and get off-world. Unfortunately for him, he gets captured by the evil slug lady. What did you think of Lady Proxima in that whole opening sequence? It's okay. I liked that she was a giant water slug that apparently was allergic to sunlight, almost like a vampire. I thought the, the opening car chase scene was fine, but I'm not a big car chase person. It's made me start thinking about pod racing when I first saw it, which is always a, a major turnoff. I also thought it was kind of weird that Kira and Han are like 20 years older than everyone else that she seems to have in her little army of people. But it's it's an okay sequence. It's got some action. They don't linger on any of that too long, which is nice because none of that is really important to the story. What you have to take away from that is that Han and Kira are in love and they're trying to, to get away. So that's what they're really showing you in that scene. I do think, and this is a theme that's going to continue on, which kind of surprised me when you told me how much you liked the look and the visuals of it, is that I thought this movie is really dark, right. darkly lit. Like, sometimes it's hard to see what's actually happening in some of the sequences, and that's especially true on Corellia, and it carries over to later in the movie until you get to the very end. But um, I, I, I had some worries about the visuals. Like, I thought it was like, we'll just make everything look dark and mucky throughout most of the movie. And I think that's the theme based on this is the, the underworld of the Star Wars, and where you have, you know, you think of the original trilogy, especially A New Hope, it's very bright. I think this is the antithesis to that, and so that's... That's how it struck me. And how yeah, but if like Chewbacca's it. gonna fight six dudes at once, I want to see it. I don't want it to be in shadows. <laughs> Flip the little thing on your remote and brighten it up a little bit, man. Nobody uses those buttons anyways. <laughs> Might as well get them some use, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I liked Proxima, like you said. I thought she had a cool design. I liked Han's escape with the, the thermal detonator thing. You know, Is that nostalgia? And I think one of the things I'm going to get critiqued on is I do enjoy some of the nostalgia. Some of it I don't. It has to land well. The thermal detonator was kind of cool. And uh, the, the way that he gets out, he's throwing it through the window and frying her face, I thought was awesome. Go ahead. When you talk about nostalgia, what I, I want to be clear about what I mean when I talk about good nostalgia and bad nostalgia, because nostalgia is not a bad thing. It's when nostalgia fits naturally into a scene where it's good, where it did with a the thermal detonator. Okay. That makes sense. There's going to be other instances where they throw nostalgia at you, even though it doesn't make sense, just to give you nostalgia. And that's where I get really turned off. Sure. So Han and Kira go on the run, trying to escape, um, they get off, trying to get off world, and they basically go through um, a really crappy customs uh, center, trying to get on a, a ship. Han makes it through. Kira gets captured, and Han is left getting off world. He left off, and he has got to escape. He gets off world by signing up for the Empire. What are your thoughts on this scene? Oh, it's fine. Yeah, I like that they kind of had this customs that they had to go through, and Han tries basically bribes his way through. It was a little coincidental that one of them can get through and the door shuts and the other one can't, but that's fine. And then I liked the recruiting stuff. I mentioned this in the trailers that that jumped out at me, that the, the Empire has to do this kind of crappy recruiting. Now, I am impressed that they just take anyone and will immediately put them in flight school. But this also has probably the one of the worst examples, and this is going to be oh something God. that... Oh, God. That Are you coming with this? I am, because oh. it, this is where it happened. And, yeah. and my one of my big problems with this movie is I don't think that they they looked at Han Solo or any of these other characters and said, 
this is where he is in A New Hope. We're going to explain why he's like this in A New Hope. Instead, they gave us just like a list of items and how he kind of collected those items. And one of those items he collects is his last oh, name. Oh, God. And... Oh, God. And I just thought that that was very cheesily done. Oh, he doesn't need to have an origin story of his last name, which is a, a guy randomly assigning it to him because he has no tribe and he's on his own. That's well, a little the too on the nose. Out. The Kazdans actually sold this movie based on this idea alone. Bob Iger was like, what? Huh. Well, a- another thing that I... I I immediately thought upon walking out of this movie is all the talk about how this is the greatest Star Wars script ever written, according to Kathleen Kennedy. It's bullshit. It's, you said yeah, it. it's, you said it's bullshit. It's bullshit. bullshit. This is a this is a, a not a the script is worse than the movie, in mm. my opinion. This is not a great written movie. I think Ron Howard did a lot to make it more exciting than it would have been. Yeah. Look, these car- characters have names that match what they do. Luke Skywalker is not literally walking across the sky. He dreams of being out in the stars. Han Solo is not literally solo, but it's more of like an attitude. If you know Star Wars, you get, right? Therm scissor punch, I'm sure maybe he scissor punches. I don't know. But that's part of the shtick. Bob Iger does not understand this. And I was reminded reminded of Kathleen Kennedy's uh, comments in Force Awakens when she said, don't you want to know what happened to Luke Skywalker? And after Last Jedi, I was like, oh, well, yeah. maybe maybe not not so much. And with Bob Iger, don't you want to know how Solo got his name? No, I'm good. I really don't. Like, it was it was a punch to the face. Like, I, I thought the negative fan reaction had gotten this out of the movie. But it was, like, the nugget that they were, like, holding to. And it just, ugh. Yeah, it's, it's cheesy and unnecessary and... Yeah, it's, gross. it's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we see a uh, montage of Han in the military acting less than heroic. He runs later into Beckett, who leads them through some harrowing battle after their commanding officer is killed. During that, Han realizes that the guys are up to something fishy, and he figures out that they're trying to rip the Empire off, and he wants in. So Beckett and company turn him down, and Han tries to blackmail them, and then he Beckett turns on them. And it's a long way of saying that Han ends up in the pit. So I want to get your thoughts on the whole, I mean, it's like a sort of like a serenity Firefly. I don't know if you watched Firefly, but that sort of beginning of Firefly reminded me a lot of this montage. It's okay. I, it's, it's again, it's really, really dark when they're in this battle. And it is kind of interesting to see kind of these grunt battles that the Empire is fighting because Han is just infantry. He's just cannon fodder being being sent he out there. Never made it to the old flight school. Well, he did. He washed out. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they yeah. they booted him out, and that that's where the tag and bink scene would have been. Would have been in his court martial when he gets thrown out, but that got cut. So you know, I'm just crying about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, apparently the castings are too. But that that sequence is okay. It was an interesting way to meet a uh, Beckett, who's Woody Harrelson and his crew. Which at that time is uh, Fanny Newton, who's Val, pl- yep. Va- yep, playing Val, and then John Favreau's uh, Rio. Rio, who is um, motion capture, and he is actually kind of what like a four armed kind of monkeyish mm-hmm. type character who's pretending to be a person, which which was kind of good. So that sequence moves pretty fast. Han's whole motivation here is, I mean, he only joined the Empire because if he didn't go into that recruiting station, he would have been arrested. And he wanted to get off the planet. And now his only goal is to get away from the Empire so he can go back to Corellia and get Kira. Because that, that's his motivation for doing everything. And he sees Beckett and their crew as a way to do that. Which is which is fine. And it, it got him off the planet. I mean, it's the sloppiness of the Empire. But I guess they've never shown us that the Empire isn't sloppy in other Star Wars movies. So you let it go. It's a, it's a pretty quick sequence. I was glad they didn't dwell on it too long. Because I think it could have really been slow if we would have spent too much time with him in the military yeah it is it is nice how it all works out in the end because we get to chewbacca which is where everybody wants us to get yeah but it's so clunky i mean this is what people who are critical of the movie are talking about you know in a realistic setting i know we're talking about laser swords and hyperdrives here but in a realistic star wars setting beckett doesn't turn him in because it brings uh, unwanted attention to him and his plan yeah. What Beckett does is he says, okay, sure, in the first opportunity, he kills Han. 
that's the move. And so, you, I mean, you can't, you don't, like you said, you don't want to dwell, but I think there's a better way to get to Han Solo. Than well, I, th- I think what they were going for, because they throw, he, Beckett is impersonating a captain, which is a much higher rank than Solo is. So he gets Solo thrown in a pen, and it's a pen where they're holding Chewie, and they think Chewie's going to eat him type deal. And then Huey and Han work together to escape out of the pit, and then they go run to Beckett, and then Beckett is like, oh, hold the ship that I'm stealing. I'm going to take these guys, too, because I see a glimmer in his eye that reminds me of me, and now I'm going to bring him with, which, with everything else we see of Beckett, doesn't really make any sense, and they don't do a good job of getting that point think, across but that was what i thought they were going for at that moment in honor of the cinematic uh paramedic what i would do is rework the script so that beckett and han are part of the imperial navy that they go to a place where chewie is enslaved and where han is like this is bullshit i'm not going to stand for this frees the slaves chewie takes on the life debt and beckett's like all right this dude and like beckett sees it somehow and he's already got a plan where he's trying to rip off the empire too because we i don't know did we see the actual life debt no occurring because it's not i mean but that's kind of an expanded universe like west end role-playing game thing yeah i mean it's it was an important part of that and it was explained as part of that but that was but i thought that was weirdly done because chewy is portrayed throughout the entire course of the movie as a freedom fighter which makes sense with what we saw in Revenge of the Sith, and he is completely dedicated to freeing his people who have been enslaved. Now, Han doesn't really do any work to bust them out of that place other than to tell Chewie, hey, you're strong, knock this pole down, and we can pull the guards out and climb out. And then later, and, and then he just goes with him and stays with him, and later in the movie, there's a part where he, he just abandons Han. Well, he, Han tells him he can, but he basically leaves Han to go help and, and save other enslaved Which people. It's one of my favorite parts of the movie, by the way. We'll get to that. Yeah. Keep going. Sorry. Yeah, but the whole point is, is is I don't understand entirely why Chewie kept staying with him and didn't leave to go do his main mission. Like, I'm, I'm sure Chewie has some honor where he says, yeah, I need to, to repay you because you did have a ship I get. You knew the people that had a ship to get me off or whatever. But it kind of seemed like... Chewie accomplished everything he could have for Han in the first half an hour of this movie and then would have just left, and I didn't really understand why he stuck around. Yeah, I think what I would like to think, and this is me apologizing for the movie, because you're hitting on the number one thing, that I, the reason that I wanted this movie is Han and Chewie. What I would say, in the absence of the whole idea of a life debt, since that's been sort of kicked to the curb, is that Han, or, I'm sorry, Chewbacca probably sees the same thing that Kira sees in Han, and the same thing that I wrote about in the, the miniseries by Marjorie Liu, that Han's full of shit, and at his core, he's a really good person. And I think that's that's what I'm going to say, as I apologize yeah, for this. Yeah, I guess I, I, the reason I don't buy that is because we've been sold at this stage between Revenge of the Sith and the beginning of this movie on, on the morals and the obligation that Chewbacca has and how dedicated he is to that. And even though he may see a glimmer in this guy, this is a guy who refuses to join the rebellion in this movie. This is a guy who, you know, is willfully going into the criminal underworld and wants to stay in the criminal underworld. So, yeah, you might see those qualities in him, but at some point, don't you go, hey, asshole, why don't you actually do some of these things that are on you? Otherwise, I'm going to just go do them without you. Like, I just don't get why. Why do you stay with him for yeah, 10 years? Why, yeah, I, there's no reason for Chewie to stay with him beyond what he needs to. And that is a real missed opportunity in this movie. Yeah, I think that's fair. What did you think of Beckett, Rio, and Val? Beckett is good, but he is the archetype that we thought he was from right. the trailers. If it <laughs> they was were a... who they thought they were. Exactly. <laughs> if he was, a... if it was a lesser actor, I think it would have been horrible. I like Thandie Newton, but she's barely in the movie. I thought she was bland. And she's, uh, she's cool because she's Thandie Newton. Yeah. She sells it well, but the, nothing happens with the character. That, that character, this is my problem with a lot of the characters in this movie, is they have one kind of plot point thing they're supposed to accomplish, and then they're out of the movie. Mm. Right? So Thandie Newton's big thing is uh, find someone to love. So that Han can be reminded of Kira, because... Woody Harrelson and Thandie Newton are in love. So she basically spends her maybe total of eight minutes of screen time spending four of it talking about how you have to find someone you love. And then she's she's dead and she's gone. And I felt nothing for it. I found John Favreau's character to be very, very annoying. It was a um, weird New Yorker in, in Star Wars. It didn't feel like it fit. It felt like a bad comedy routine. 
I didn't love the character design, and his whole purpose in being there was to allow Han to be a pilot and to say, don't die alone. And the minute he says that, we know what's going to happen. We already knew what was going to happen. It was really telegraphed because they don't need a pilot because they have Rio, but they take Han anyway. So obviously Rio's going to die and they're going to need a pilot, which is exactly what happens. So there are two characters that breeze in. They both have, you know, one character trait that they're supposed to accomplish. They do that. They immediately die. And I don't feel a thing for them. And this is going to continually happen throughout this movie. And during the middle of this movie, I really thought about Rogue One and the deaths in Rogue One and how earned those deaths were for those characters. And you understood why and how, and you cared when they died. And I didn't care about anyone that died in this movie. I didn't have a single emotion. In fact, most of the time I went good. I'm glad they're out of the movie. And I think, again, that just goes to how, for me, this movie is kind of a, it, it, it's shallow, it's breezy, it's it's a surfacey movie. There isn't much below what you're seeing there, and I think these are characters that demonstrate it. So we move on, Han's thrown in the belly of the beast, almost literally, to take a line out of the hero's journey, which this movie takes a lot from the hero's journey, as most Star Wars do. And he meets the almighty Chewbacca. Luke, what do you think about how him and Chewie meet up, and... Um, how that's I, different. I mean, I think maybe you already kind of touched on this. I think bit. I would like it better upon second viewing, but because I was expecting something bigger and the life debt and all that stuff, and then it wasn't that, I kind of had a moment of, oh, that's it? Mm-hmm. I thought it was going to be something bigger than it was, and it just wasn't. But I think maybe now that I understand what they were going for, it could be something that improves on second viewing, but I would say it's underwhelming. For me, the the thing that I did, I actually liked it. I liked it more than the... F- you would have to do a lot to have him in the military. So I think this was a quick and easy way to do it and get the same thing and and kind of stick more with just the, the fast paces of the movie, mm-hmm. um, which I thought was one of its strengths and, like you mentioned, one of its weaknesses in, in what you were talking about. See, and I don't think it would have been that hard. I think what you need is you need a scene, instead of Beckett turning him in, Beckett being like, okay, but drop everything now and come with me. And you have Han seeing, you know, an enslaved Chewbacca being, you know, beaten and being like, well, no, I can't drop everything. I'm going to, I'm going to save this guy because I can't tolerate that, even though I want off this planet desperately. And then you have a reason for Chewbacca to be more indebted to him than they really gave us. And you haven't spent any more screen time. In fact, you probably spent less and you have a little bit more feeling for those characters. True. So anyways, Han and Chewie convince Beckett to take him with them for their big job, which is the train heist scene uh, that Pat referred to in his question. Mm-hmm. The scoundrels are after some coaxium, which is a MacGuffin that's about basically like hype makes hyperdrive fuel. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's very valuable, it's so very everyone valuable. wants it. And ultimately, the job is not so successful, which really pisses Beckett's boss, Dryden boss, off later. Um, it's basically Enfys Ness comes in and fucks the whole thing up. Um, what'd you think of that action scene? You were you weren't too big on the, uh, the the car chase scene. What about this? I like I like this better. I think it goes on a little bit too long, but I like the Sky Riders. I like Emphis Nest character design, having them kind of come in and you don't know who they are and disrupt this. This is where you get the two very telegraphed depths of right. Danny Newton and Rio, which we saw coming. Danny Newton blows herself up for love to to save the rest of the team, and Rio gets shot and bleeds out, meaning Han has to fly the ship. So it, it's a good action sequence. It's it's fun. It's not one of the best action sequences in Star Wars. I don't think you're going to get any action sequence here that I cringe at. Mm-hmm. There isn't a pod racing scene where I'm just wanting to fast forward, but there isn't one where you go, I can't wait for that action sequence. But I think this is this is a, a pretty a pretty good sequence to follow and to watch and and to see. They end up not getting the coaxium and then having to go to the big sail barge or yacht of. Dryden, which I really liked. I thought that was a pretty cool setup. So that's the next one we're going to talk about. Meeting between Beckett, Dryden, Voss. Then we get to see Han reunite with Kira. Um, Han cuts the deal so that they can get some unrefined coaxium. But they spend a lot of time in a bar scene. And every Star Wars movie has that bar scene. This one I really liked. It had, you know, the dancing lady with the sort of translator over her mouth and, like, the shimmering gold, which I thought was really cool to look at. Tons of different aliens in a different vibe than we've seen before. And it reunites Kira and Han, which is a relationship that I thought 
worked a lot better than I than I was anticipating going into the movie. What'd you think? Yeah, and it's three years later that since they left each other on Corellia, she's now Dryden's second in command, basically running his organization. She's branded. It's what is it, Crimson Dawn? Mm-hmm. Is that what it's called? So she she's a part of this kind of underworld that Beckett is indebted to, and now that he couldn't get him coaxium, they're basically going to kill them. It, it, it was good. I, I, I really like, like you said, I like the design of the set. I liked the bar scene. I like what Paul Bettany was doing. They don't give Paul Bettany a lot to do That's in this I movie. To about. Like, I, you said that you liked him. I like what he did with what he was given. And I wanted to ask you, like, there's something that doesn't work here for me. And it's not how he acts, because I think that's very interesting. It's just like something is not hitting right. I like the actor. I like what he's trying to do, but it just didn't feel right. And I can't put my finger on it. I don't really know. So so for me, what I like about what Paul Bettany did is he kind of has this character that you kind of get the impression is this actual real savage, savage, brutal character, but who sees himself as this refined aristocrat. And he's trying really hard to hold on to that that fake shell of a refined aristocrat, yeah. but he can't. He busts out in these kind of anger surges and stuff. The problem for me is is that character has n- no motivation, no story, no anything. He's just evil because they need someone to be really, really evil. So he just show- shows up and walks in and is evil, and that's it, and then he's gone, and then he comes back to be evil again when they need someone to be evil. This movie doesn't have really a central villain that's driving the story in any way, so it's just kind of like, well, we need a, a bad guy. And I would be really curious because this was the Michael K. Williams role that got redone completely because he couldn't be there for the reshoots. So I wonder if if the look changed, obviously, because it was going to be a mocap performance. But I wonder if the character was completely changed as well. So that would that would be something interesting to find in the backstory. So I like what Paul Bet. What you said to me is right on the you know nail on the hammer on the nail or whatever bad analogy I'm fumbling through right now that. Paul Bettany does well. He was given nothing good to work with. Right. I think villains work best when you can understand their mo- motivation. It's one of the things that I think saves The Last Jedi in some respects for me. That makes it better than, than the things I dislike about it. We understand with Kylo Ren why he's a bad guy. You know, we understood. We saw that conflict within him. Vader becomes a really cool villain in retrospect after Return of the Jedi. Here, this villain is kind of like it doesn't really, I don't know. It's yeah. Not, it's not the, you know, and it's not the Emperor. The Emperor is kind of evil just to be evil, but you know what? Like, he's fucking badass, so you, you excuse it. Um, so, basically they cut that deal, and Han, Kira, Chewbacca, and Beckett attempt to go win a ship, and they're gonna, or to go get a ship, and Han basically throws everything into a, a, a game of Sabacc versus a guy named Lando Calrissian. We get to meet him. Lando's droid L3 and because it doesn't work out Calrissian wins in what I thought was a really cool scene uh, but because of Calrissian's admiration of Beckett he decides hey I want in on this for part of the cut and I'll you know bring you aboard my ship what do you think of the very oppressively complex gambling scene between Lando and Han it's Donald Glover time so obviously yeah. everyone's super excited yeah. he brings everything to life so he's everything he's fabulous you have heard about him is true yep yep you heard it here first even if we want to forget the Super Bowl episode trailer review I, I would like to <laughs> I was wrong I admitted but, that and I apologized and you could learn something from me and give some forgiveness move on I, I liked how they set this scene up and what it, I mean it looks like a grimy back alley poker game where people are constantly cheating and it, it reminded me of an old West saloon which is this movie I think is trying to invoke a lot of old West and this is one of the ones where they did a really good job on that so this is a, a fun scene I liked I don't know what you call those creatures but Jabba's got some in his palace that have six eyes and one of them's you know using one to look at Hans cards and and all this type of thing. So it, it's a fun scene. This is Ironreich at his best as well for me because what I love about Han Solo is that that cocky overconfidence that just completely fails. And there's two instances of that happening really well in this movie. And one is this Sabacc tournament where he thinks he's going to win and the movie wants you to think he's going to win and then he doesn't win the Falcon. Uh, and there's another one that's better that we'll get to later. But the he... Einreich pulls that off really, really well. That that kind of charming, I'm I'm so confident and better and I got this locked down and then just completely blows it. And also we should mention, and I thought this was this is another another thing that 
is going to be a check mark in the down for me on this movie about how they just are trying to move the plot forward without really thinking about things. Cure is along with them on this mission. And we're meant to believe she's number two in the entire organization and that Dryden is deeply in love with her. But then he's like, oh, I'm, I'm sending you to do this mission that's probably going to fail and you're all going to die. And if it doesn't fail, I'm going to kill you. So I don't really understand if Dryden loves her or hates her or what that was. And I don't think, I think they wanted us to think he loved her, but they didn't really have a good reason for her to go on this mission. So they just said, well, we'll just tell him to do it anyway. I think, I don't think he loves her. I think he just owns her. That's what I think. I think this is a movie. But she's his weak spot. Later in the movie. Yeah. Literally said. Yeah. So. I think, uh, I don't know. This is a movie, like I said, I mean, the theme is freedom. And I think that's. You haven't talked about that, by the way. I have not talked about that. I talked about the theme. But I think that the the theme overall, the movie is, is, it's a movie about freedom. And I think she's not loved, she's owned. I think a lot of Dryden Voss's uh, motivations are, like, he's an unreliable narrator. The shit that he says is not what he really feels. I think you put the nail on the head. But she said the hammer on the nail. Hit the nail one of those on things. The head. Damn, which one is it? Out um, of the park. I think he hit it out of the park. Um, when you had said that, like, he, he really tries to be something he's not. In some ways, he's a lot like Han, where he's just full of shit. And so I think, I, I don't know, I excused it. I probably apologize way too much about this, but good God, Glover's performance, the voice especially. Had to Mannerisms. Take, uh, just everything. Had to take so much work to get it as perfect as he did. Nobody I have ever seen in person or on screen has loved the Star Wars character as much as Donald Glover must love Lando. He has said in interviews that's the first toy he ever had with it's, Lando figures. This is the real deal. This is the best performance, in my opinion, of a Star Wars character ever. The the, the care, the precision, um, he had to work his ass off for this. And we also get L3. I was shaky with L3 on this in this um, scene until she gets on the Falcon and Lando's like, hey, you know, can I get you anything? And she's like, equal rights. And from then on, I loved L3. Um I'll talk more about that character later, but um, any other things you want to say about the the card game? No, it's good, and then we get the first shot of the Falcon, which is, again, a little too dark, and it's one you've seen in the trailers, but it's nice to see it, especially in its shiny, unbroken form. Um, First trailer just had Han, and then in the movie and in the the next trailer it has Chewie with it, which I think is... I love how they're doing this with trailers now, how they're scrubbing things out to try and throw off what's going on right. i think that's fun i think that does that does help so they get to castle and they go through with the plan to steal the coaxium things go off the rails a bit l3 leads a droid rebellion chewy deserts to go free some slaves and it seems like it's all going to go haywire but those things are necessary for them to actually get out what did you think about uh the the castle scene this is a ridiculous plan they have <laughs> i don't think they As really all Han Solo plans I, mean, are. I guess they don't this is a terrible plan it makes zero sense what their actual plan was other than to show up and say that they're selling slaves and then were they just going to kill everyone there and escape because l 3s slave rebellion is not part of the plan so i don't really understand what their plan was i don't think there really was one but it's an okay sequence you get the old lando armor that he uses in return of the jedi to hide in java's palace but woody harrelson's wearing it so that's kind of fun i thought that was a good nostalgia thing without having to cram it down our throats, unlike Han Solo getting his blaster in a long dramatic shot oh, where they disassemble yeah, and throw him his blaster. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it's okay sequence. Chewie fighting in the slave pit is probably my favorite action sequence of it. I mean, he is brutal, no holds barred, and it's really the first time we've seen him fight hand-to-hand. It's like Logan in Logan. Yeah. It's like, it's the real fucking yeah. deal. He is, he is brutal and destroys people, and I Vader loved that. It's yeah. Like... Yeah, so that that was great. You know, L3 dies in this sequence trying to escape, and we should probably talk about L3 because I am very much one of the people that hate L3. Okay. I was ex- very, very happy when she went. I thought she was very, very annoying. I think she was given, um, I think they watched K2SO and said, we need to make a sassy droid like that one and have it in there let's think of one personality trait and we'll give that to her and that'll be her thing and then she'll be gone abruptly i i I thought it was this is another one of a very unearned death 
They want it to be dramatic. They want us to care about this person dying, but they haven't spent any time trying to get us to invest in that person. So I don't care when it happens. There, there's just so much unearned about that character. For me, this this is this is a story like I said about freedom, and I saw early on what I think is the, the theme of this movie, and the way that L three fits into that reminded me a lot of feminism today, and you could you could substitute any sort of civil right, but we've talked in reviewing the show about the way that droids are treated, and immediately when she said equal rights. I started thinking about it. Here is, in, in, in granted, it's a short run, and I think you're right about that, but you get a droid who, and we can't fill the entire movie with 15 characters that we care about. Uh, I didn't say that, but they did that in Rogue One, so maybe you can. But in any event, I, I'm not as offended at the shortness of it. But to get back to the point, L3, her whole issue is that she's talking shit about droids' rights, something that we have talked a lot about. And she just talks and talks and talks. And it's not until she actually fucking does something that she actually makes a difference. And to me, that spoke about, you know, all the shit going on in the world and all the terrible things happening to people who are marginalized by our society. And it was kind of a call to, you actually have to fucking do something rather than just talk about something. And so that's why I love her. And I don't think for K2SO, when you look at it like that, K2SO was just snarky. That was his purpose in Rogue One. I love Rogue One, but L3... I think was more important to the story and more important to the theme, I thought. See, I, I this this theme that you've connected with deeply, I don't think was necessarily intended, and I think I, I don't think there's enough depth to it for what they were going on their own. I mean, if you if you read interviews with Joe uh, Jonathan Kasdan, he says the main theme of the movie is everyone has a boss that they have to report to. No matter who you are, you have a boss. He even says. Uh, our, our surprise cameo at the end, like, they they have a boss. So no matter what you do, you have a boss, and we want to make a Michael Mann crime film. Well, I think... So I don't even think they were intending it as, these are all people who are struggling for their freedom. I think it was, well, we're the, we're the crimey underworld. We all, gotta, we all gotta kick it up to someone. And I don't feel like they spent, you spent enough time with L3 to earn any of that. I think it's, she saw some droids fighting and said, don't do that. She had the equal rights line, and then she frees the revolt. And that's basically everything she does. Right. I mean, but what she is, has what maybe... is her purpose in the story? Is her, the her, purpose in want... the story is to, is to further the plot and the theme, right? Any character in the story. And the main characters of the story, in my opinion, are Han and Chewie. So ultimately, they are the ones, and in, in some respects, Kira, in a different way. And so why I consider L3, like, yes, her arc is very short, but it's a defined arc. I would rather have that than what happened to Poe and Finn in The Last Jedi. I think I that... Think it serves the overall thing. I think her, her point is to be the Nava system of the Millennium Falcon that gets them through the Kessel Run. That's the reason I think she's in the movie. And I also didn't buy her love story with Lando. I don't... I don't never yeah, got the. I, I never got the impression that Lando saw it like that. She has one line about how he's he's into her, but she she's not really that interested. But he's very dismissive of her for most of the movie, and all he talks about her is that she's a Nava computer, and that's why he wants her because she's the best Nava computer. And then she dies, and he has this big dramatic upset about her dying. But what does he do? He grabs her Nava system and jams it into the Falcon. And then they never talk about her again. Yeah. She's never mentioned. She's never whatever. Lando's completely fine. That was actually one part that I didn't like about the movie because Lando, the acting was really bad during that scene. It was over dramatic. Yep. It, it was, and 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 that's like I I think L L three for me was written in there to be the Nava system that gets them to do the Kessel Run and to be a callback to C three PO talking to the Falcon in Empire Strike Back and saying that he doesn't know where. It learned to communicate. Yeah, I, I think I just so. disagree with you. I, I took yeah, more from we, it. we saw As different it was things happening. I saw maybe I saw what I wanted to see, but at the same time, it fit the overall theme of the story. I think it was well done in short, and you can't devote a ton of screen time to a ton of characters. They chose to devote a lot of screen time to three major characters. Did you feel worse when L three died or when K two S O died? Definitely K two S O. Okay. Um, definitely K two S O. But I don't think the, that was not the purpose, in my opinion. She furthered the plot in a way. He, we got to know more. I don't judge a character's death on how much I care about them. And I think that's one of the, the major differences. I, I don't need everybody okay. to have like a huge story for me to, to think that their story matters 
it, it, yeah, she died, and maybe you know that put and maybe it's plot points. Like I guess, I guess but... for me, the difference between two of them, and I'll let you respond, and then we should probably move on. Yeah. Is I felt like K two S O felt like a, a full character that had different rationale and different motivations to do different things, and I felt like K two S O was a droid where someone programmed in robot rights and then let it run. Like whoever designed or whoever designed L three was like. Robot rights, that's what you care about. And then that that's it, and that was all there, I there was to her. I think that's one of the critiques of fem, fem, fe, ah, feminism. I don't agree with that critique, but I think that is some of the critique against that movement. And so that would just feed into me liking the character more. So scene, the next scene is the special effects extravaganza, right? We, we plug L3 into the hyperdrive. She becomes the Falcon, in a sense. And um, Lando has also been wounded. And so Han and Chewie have to fly the plane, right? Or fly, fly the Falcon, excuse me. Originally, like, he's going to have Kira do the, the, the... And I love this part. That is good. Like, he has Kira be, like, the co-pilot. She has no idea what she's doing. And this is when Han's like, wait, like, Chewbacca, you like 200 years old. Like, you look great. You're 190 years old. So they pa- pilot it through the castle run. And the smuggler makes the decision to shave off time in order to avoid the Empire and the giant space squid. All in the hopes of getting the coaxium. We didn't mention that the coaxium has to get back to the planet in enough time. Yeah, it'll explode. It'll explode. And that's another, you know, another chase scene thing. You put, like, you know, like the speed thing. You put, like, a, a little governor on it. Like, in speed, what is the 55 miles an hour? Mm-hmm. It's going to blow up. So it's the same sort of thing. And I like the bit about L3 becoming part of the Falcon. Because it's a character I like. I literally have not met or seen anybody else who's liked L3. And so I may be the only person out there, but I am, like, the one person who, who enjoys that it's part of the Falcon. I enjoyed that it got her out of the movie. Oh, yeah. Well, all the different things, I suppose. Visually, I was worried about it as we were going in, because I was like, ooh, the special effects, I don't know if I'm going to like this. And I was okay with it. I, I was fine with the giant squid monster. What did you think? I liked this a lot. So it starts out, they're going through the Maelstrom, which looks like a big electrical storm. And, the you know, Parsecs is a unit of measure, not a time. So... They're kind of, they're explaining why it's 12 parsecs and why that's impressive and it's more interesting than if it had just been this ship goes really fast. So we were able to get there really fast. So there's one direct route through this maelstrom and as they're going through it, a Star Destroyer comes out, which was a fantastic visual and it drops TIE Fighters and it was, it looked like a new version of a TIE Fighter that had a big gun on it comes to to chase them because they know something's going on on that planet and they don't want anyone else well, to get coaxium either. It's an either. uprising with yeah. Russell, you know, and so they're like, what that? So they're getting chased by TIE fighters. They can't go the direct route, so they have to cut through the Maelstrom, and that's where they utilize L3 and her nav system because she has the most in-depth nav system in the universe or galaxy. And they go through, they go into the space squid. I enjoyed the space squid uh, much better than the manta rays we got in Clone Wars in space. <laughs> My, my... This is much more violent than those chill, like, hippie manta rays that were just floating through the orange that you hated. Exactly. I, I those whales. My problem was is it went too long once I got yeah. past that, and then they're going to get sucked into a black hole or something, and they have to supercharge everything with a drop of the coaxium to burst them out, and then it didn't work, and then it did work. I could have skipped all that to, to cut, keep the movie rolling, because it... All the good parts of that chase had run its course at that point, and you're just kind of like, away, get on, get on with it. To get it. away, just make Han and Chewie badass together. Yeah, yeah, and just get through the Maelstrom and get past that squid and, and be done and, and move on. So I like the sequence a lot. I, I think the beginning of the sequence is my favorite part of the movie. But yeah, cut it, cut it down. So team gets the Coaxium to the beach planet, and they're trying to meet Va- or Voss, and the Coaxium gets settled, doesn't explode. And everything's looking good, except they find out that Enfys Nest has found out where they are. It's the boogie man gal. I didn't really know beforehand because I was trying to stay away from spoilers. I didn't know if it was a guy or a gal. I didn't really thought sure. about it. Um, I and, bet most people would have assumed it was a man. Yeah. Uh, but we find out that Nest isn't actually a heartless scoundrel, but part of the rebels trying to steal stuff It hel- you know, it, that will help it against the Empire. So what did you think about this little twist? Pu- I didn't see the, it coming. The twist part of it, I think, is awful, really? to be honest. Yeah, I mean, the scene leading up to it is great. It's that old Westie. You've all seen the shot of him with the blaster on his hip, and they're on a beach or whatever. But, you know, it's kind of this Emphis Nest slowly takes off the helmet and, you know, reveals it's a woman, and then there's kind of a dramatic pause, and I just sat there and went, am I supposed to know who this is? Am I supposed to be, <gasps> how could a, a, a robber be a woman? Yeah, I, I didn't know what exactly they wanted me to dramatically take yeah, from the, that. I like the character. Let me say that. I like the character. 
But I was like, is she Beckett and Val's daughter? Like, that was oh. the only thing that I could, like, I, I didn't Oh, okay. Her. So, like, I thought that was the reason that everybody was, like... Which she wasn't. Like, right. And she wasn't a character we'd ever seen before. No. And there, I mean, there is, I, I don't think I'm crazy. I think there was, like, three or four seconds where it just lingers on her. Like, you're supposed to be soaking this in. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to be soaking in. And then she explains to him that she's trying to form the rebellion, basically, right. or be part of the rebellion, fight fight the Empire and all those things, which is great or fine, but I don't get why now. Like, you've been fighting with Beckett, it sounds like, for years upon years. You were at the train heist. You could have just killed them all like you tried to at the train and taken the coaxium. But for whatever reason, this time, when you have them greatly outnumbered, you're like, hey, now I'm going to reason with you and bring you to our side. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't, I, it seemed lazy to me. To be yeah, honest, it, lazy say, it does seem it does seem lazy. But to me, another thing that I really dug out of it is my daughter thought this was badass. Oh, that's like, cool. She was like, you know, you get this scary person with a scary mask, and you know how my daughter loves scary. We've talked about that. It's a good character show. design. And um, you know, if they're gonna spin somebody off, let me go back. Can I go back and sure. change my answer about Poe Dameron to Pat? Sure. I think I go Emphasis Ness. Nice. In any event, I forgot. I think it's before this where Kira calls out Han when she, you know, the line from the trailer, you know, that no one knows who you really are except for Kira. Mm-hmm. And then he says, well, who's that? And then it cuts in the trailer. And her answer, I think, is great. And it's just like, you're the hero. And she called him immediately on his bullshit, which to me gets the character so right. So this is the reason that I'm apologizing for a lot of this movie is because, and I've talked to you before. If you get Captain America right in the movie, I'm going to like the movie. If you get Iron Man right, and this is where it gets Han right. is It, it strikes to the core of who he is, and that's where I disagree with you. Maybe, maybe it's not as deep, and it's not, not not maybe, it's not as deep as we would have liked it to be, but it gets the character perfectly, and um, that was my favorite part of the movie, and I think I forgot to mention it. So. Yeah, and then the, they decide from here that they're going to, to help out. They're not going to give the coaxium back. So they make an elaborate ruse, a cunning and clever attempt right. to trick Dryden. <laughs> that was great. That was clerks. I Thank you. Yeah. Happens. So they they go they go to confront Dryden basically, and uh, you know, man, there's been this weird question hanging over our heads ever since Woody Harrelson told us, you know, an hour and a half ago that everyone will betray you. Don't trust anyone or whatever. So Dryden go they go in to see Dryden with their kind of fake coaxium, and then. He reveals he knows their plot, and he knows that's not really the coaxium, because there is a traitor among them, and there is, like, a slow, dramatic pause and a door opening for the most obvious reveal in the history of movies that Woody Harrelson betrayed them. Um, I did like that he didn't betray them because he's particularly a bad guy. He just didn't want to die. But it's it's another slow, long, un- unearned reveal that we knew from the trailer uh, a fight breaks out. They do the exact same type of thing with Kira, where she betrays Tra- uh, Han, and then she could stab Han, but she stabs Dryden, and, and they make witty comments. This is where Kira says that we talked about earlier, where she says, I'm your biggest weakness to Dryden, you know, and, and then stabs him, and a, a fight breaks out, and they end up killing him. I I was waiting for this whole section to be done because it was generic and it was kind of, it was i roll worthy i mean han actually double tricked them because he brought the real coaxium and faked out the people that were trying to kill Emphis nest and take her coaxium and There's a lot of coaxium going it, on, right? it reminded me of uh, a scene in Austin Powers, the first Austin Powers. I was gonna say Wayne's World. It's oh, really? The best. Yeah. No, there's a scene in the first Austin Powers where uh, he's in a hot tub with um, whatever the sexual entendre name is in in that movie, and a she's lot of vagina. yeah, and she she says. She says something about, he, he asked her some question about, oh, is that for your boss or whatever? And she's like, yeah, how did you know that? And he all smugly just goes, I didn't. You just told me. And it was the most obvious thing in the world. That's what Han's doing in this whole scene. Like, yeah. I thought this was eye roll worthy bad yeah, as far as cringy. reveals and what they're doing. And it, it, it just needed to end. I will say part of it redeems in the actual end climax for me. 
and I'll get to that in just a second. But before we get there, we need to get to what is undoubtedly, at least my guess, one of your favorite parts of the movie. Um, they kill Voss. Beckett takes Chewbacca. They bolt out of there. And Han's like, come on, we gotta go. And she's like, I'll be right with you. I got some things that I gotta take care of. I Again, can't. obvious what's happening. Right. And then she calls... Because she's going to betray... Well, not betray everything, but she's going to... She's lying to him. She's not coming with him. She wants to run the criminal empire. Right. And so she calls her boss, uh, her new boss, which was Voss's old boss, and it's your boy, Maul. Yeah, so that was... Formerly Darth Maul. I never saw that coming anywhere, and I was so excited. And everyone has been talking about the robot legs. I didn't even catch the robot legs on there, so I was My daughter is sitting there like, what the... You know, she didn't say that, but she had the look on her face like... That dude's dead, and I actually told her in the theater, look at his legs. Like, they put new legs on him. Yeah, and I, I didn't I didn't even see the legs. I was just looking at the row, waiting for it to come down. And when they brought it down and it was him, I was very, very excited. He had the same lightsaber he uses in Rebels and Clone Wars. Uh, so, yeah, that was, that was awesome. I really hope that this reveal wouldn't be for a solo sequel, because who knows if there'll be one. But even when I thought there would be, I would rather see him go up against other people like i'd like to see them branch it off and not just have it be it seems weird that han solo would go fight darth maul Mm -hmm. and then never mention that or have it ever come up or have him question whether the force exists in a new hope um so i hope it's a setup for another movie in a kind of marvel shared universe Mm -hmm. type way but i was very excited by that it's just a hologram of him but yay i know this is I don't want to crap on any of your parade. I didn't care for it. I, I didn't like how they brought Maul back in the in the cartoons, and so I don't like it here. Um, I did like that Kira took over to gain her own freedom. She's getting her own freedom in the criminal element, and um, which brings her arc to a close. But I kind of wish it just would have been Java. I mean, I yeah, but Han's going off to see Java because we yeah, hear that he someone's to putting together that a was, team on Tatooine. That was, all, that was all like, why can't Java just be the the biggest badass on the block like why does it got to be like Darth Maul or somebody new because he's too busy taking care of Punky Boo or whatever his little kid was from the Clone Wars movie (laughs) what was that what did she keep calling him slimy butt or like stinky stinky she called him and then there was there was something else but I love Ahsoka now but part of that's how far she has come well that movie that movie's horrible but yeah so then that Almost brings us to the end, but of We're course there. there's one more key thing to be revealed. So, uh, Han, two more things we need to talk about. Han catches up with Beckett as Tobias goes into a long speech how, that we're all expecting. You should have seen this coming. I've been telling you the whole time. Blah, 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 and then just Han just shoots him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, of course, there's, you know, he shot first. Yeah. You know, type well, thing, which which is, is great. It's a good scene. It It's very reminiscent of what I first thought of. I didn't yes. even think about the, the shot first thing from Star Wars. Indiana Jones. Yeah, I thought yeah. Indiana Jones first, which... Is one of the best scenes in movie history. Yeah, so it, the climax for me is great because it's it's the movie poking fun in itself almost. Like, yeah. It's like you should have seen this coming. Never saw this coming. Blah blah blah. Now I'm gonna talk to you and boom, just popped him. And so I like that. So then Han gives the coaxium to Emphis Nest, who in return gives Han enough for his own ship, but that's not good enough for Han because there's only one ship that he really really wants. So he goes to find Lando. And um, when he sees him, he lifts the card that Lando uses to cheat. So at that time... Because Lando to... cheated in the first oh, yeah. game to win. We forgot to mention that. He yeah. had a card Lando... in his sleeve. Yep. So he, he gets that. This time Han wins, gets the Falcon, and we roll credits. So what would you think about this whole turn? That that was fine. I, I enjoyed it. You know, obviously we had to see it, but it was weird because it kind of felt rushed. Mm-hmm. And at the end, or like a Marvel end credit scene almost, and you think of it as this major moment for the franchise. Which I'm okay with. Like, but, we don't need to... We don't need yeah. To... I mean, I don't want to sit through a 15-minute Sabacc game right. for a second time or anything like that. But, you know, we we knew it, it was coming, though. Part of me thought it would have been funny if he just didn't win the Falcon, the Falcon at yeah. all. Yeah. But we're probably not getting a sequel, so it's a good thing he did, I guess. Right. right. Um... I didn't buy at all that Han would give that money to the Rebellion or into this house. No. Which, yeah, he gives all the coaxium to them. Basically starts funding the Rebellion right. on his own. Which I thought was a little cringy. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I would have rather had it, like, blow up and everybody has to leave. Like, there would have been some problem because, of, I don't know, because coaxium is coaxium and then all of a sudden... Well, and they teased going. the explosiveness for so long right. on it and then, you know, 
they never what is that i can't remember what the the phrase is but you know if you introduce a knife in act one then you should use the knife in act three you know which they kind of didn't do with the coaxium but right and that's over the last two in these star wars movies where they've done that so that got me thinking about a new hope which made me think which pissed me off because that made me think of a plot hole between a new hope and empire he gets all that money right for saving the princess why doesn't he use that shit to buy to pay off java uh, my impression was he just never got back there, because he was working in the he was working in the rebellion then. Yeah, but we, I mean, I don't know. Because guess... he was leaving, he was trying to leave Hoth to go pay Java. That's why he's trying to get out of there and not that going on a like transport. Three years later, bro. <laughs> like, yeah, well, what, what it's a big universe, and you're a big big general now, or whatever he is, commander, captain, of the captain. Thing. Yeah, I did like how Henry wanted Lando's Hawaiian shirt was like perfect and one of the things i love about or lando excuse me and i didn't mention this enough earlier is they make him vulnerable like he's a little dorky the fashion sense is a little weird he's he's weak in parts and that makes him a much better character if he was just i'm a badass because i'm lando and i'm donald glover and this is who i am i'm just cool all the time yeah be poe dameron then right and and i like poe dameron but i this is better yeah and and this makes me want well and and this is yeah this is a guy who is at a certain point and he's working to the point where we see him you know 15 years down the road and uh, a lot of what he's doing to even get cloud city is a facade Mm -hmm. so it's it was fun to see that there are holes at this age in his facade that he's still trying to build up and man he has it mastered by empire so we can now come to the part of the show where you're gonna give it the pews how many pews does Laura Dern give this via you? Ah. Or do you give this via book? I don't know. I, I guess I would two and a half to three. It's it's fine. I had a, a decent time watching it. I'm not going to buy this one. It's going to be the first Star Wars movie I don't buy. I, I'm sure I probably will at some point see it again. But it's not something I'm going to seek out to see again. It's disappointing that this cast might not get brought back because... I think the cast is really good. I just think they weren't given a lot to work with. They had all those production problems that weren't related to the cast. It's butted up against Last Jedi. It's butted up against Affinity War and Deadpool. It just really didn't have the legs that people thought it was going to be, which is, is too bad. But for me, I would say don't don't rush to the theater and see this. I think this is a rental-type movie, and it, that makes me a little worried that I'm saying that about a Star Wars movie now. Yeah. For me, I, there are six Star Wars movies that I love, uh, three that I tolerate, and one that is driving me crazy, and this is one of the ones that I love. I love the theme of freedom. I love Han and Chewie. They have now taken back the mantle of favorite Star Wars characters from Luke, which for the past probably five years of my life, it was Luke when I really... Um, so they are kind of made a comeback. I love the characterization. It's not a film without its problems, but you know what? When I look at the list, most of the ones on my list have pretty big problems with it. It ranks number five for me. It ranks just above Return of the Jedi, just below A New Hope. This would be below Revenge of the Sith for me. Yeah, I figured as much. I figured as much. So that's our uh, Star Wars review. Thank you for uh, listening to that. And that is all we have time for today. Luke, tell all the people out there. Tell them about how to contact you. To get in touch. (laughs) To reach you. At Luke underscore Neitzel, N-E-I-T-Z-E-L. I'm at Maya Madrid on Twitter. And we, together, are at Kid Seriously on Twitter. We're also on the interwebs where you can email us, kidseriouslyradio at gmail.com. For Luke and Maya Madrid, that's me. Take it easy. Bye. <laughs>